What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Today, we have a great live stream for you with a bunch of questions. Go down to the description below if you want to check out the questions, jump to your favorite ones uh, and uh, listen to those only. And then you could watch the whole thing again all the way from the beginning. But uh, some great questions today. We're talking a lot about transcription, talking a lot about rhythm changes, talking about the upcoming rhythm changes course that's coming, talking about the jazz trombone boot camp coming in June 2021. Uh, and a lot more. So I hope you'll enjoy this Q&A. Thanks for being here as always, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Oh, that we're the registration period is open for the Jazz Trombone Bootcamp 2021. Uh, we're going to have great guest artists like Steve Davis, Michael Davis, Vincent Gardner, Andre Hayward, and we're going to get together and talk about Jazz Trombone uh, for five days in June 14 through 18. So if you're interested, nickfinzer.store, and you can find boot camp there. Uh, hope to see you there. Uh, we're going to, we have a lot a little bit more room and some scholarships available this year. So get in touch with me if you're interested in those things. What's your favorite classical solo that you've performed? I like the Schulich. Uh, I like that. I like the Grundahl Concerto. I know they're overplayed, but, um, and then the first um, piece that I ever learned that I, when I was really serious about trombone was uh, Barat Andante in Allegro. You probably say that in the name probably differently, but what are you gonna do? I actually wrote a tune on my first record, um, Exposition. I wrote this tune called, um, Eventide. Uh, let me see if it'll play. There, now it's playing. Hopefully you guys can hear that. I see that it's playing, I think. And this is this tune is actually the, um, the chord progression from that tune. Right, right here. So that's where this comes from. Classical piece, actually, uh, Andante and Allegro, and then, then the next part is like. Just, uh, just a, a like a transposition. Okay, cool. Glad the microphone is better. I'm gonna get all kinds of copyright flags for my own music, but that's okay. So anyway, that's where that comes from. So now you can see that it really was a favorite piece, but I do like playing that Schulich piece because it's um, really big, dramatic. I like to make lots of drama when I'm playing classical music. What's your favorite solo you've transcribed? Favorite solo? I feel like there's a favorite solo for like every type of thing that you're trying to work on. Like just in terms of, I love just playing Steve Davis solos because they're one just like so swinging and simple and melodic. That's one thing. Um, I really like J.J. Mon Mysterioso. Um, I like trying to play the Nat Adderley solo on Mysterioso and try to play them back to back. That's like a really good workout. Transcribe Chick's solo on Now He Sings, or Matrix from Now He Sings, Now He Sobs. Like that's just really hard. And I like doing stuff that's hard. So sometimes um, I like to just do something like that. There, I, I like to do things that are hard. So anything that's hard is kind of, I'm drawn to. Cause, just because I want to be able to, because I always feel like if you do something hard, on the trombone, like transcription wise or working on technical study wise, that it really just frees you up when you go to improvise because that's the hardest thing you're gonna play. And then when you go to like imagine something to play, you're probably not gonna imagine something that's any harder than those hard things that you've already played. So this week, what I've been working on is um, Web City. Does any of you guys know that tune, Web City? So it's kind of like a rhythm changes, but it's got a different bridge. It's a Bud Powell tune. So I wanna talk about Bud Powell. Bud Powell tunes sometimes get overlooked and um, I encourage you to, if you are like number one, like sick of Charlie Parker tunes, not that there's anything wrong with Charlie Parker tunes, but just that they get shoved down your throat during school. You might want to keep investigating that language, the language of bebop, um, but want to learn different tunes by different people. So you might go ahead and check out Bud Powell's music. Um, I really think that it's super um, friendly for trombone. The range is a little more friendly and um, I don't know, just the way he plays, it has a little bit less turns and the turns that he plays are more idiomatic to trombone than um, Bird. So I really like I really like people to learn bouncing with Bud and Celia. And I like this one that I was just learning this week, Web City. There's a great record, Barry Harris, Luminescence. Slide is playing on there and he takes a cool, a good solo on there. That's where I learned the tune from this week. Um, granted, it's also the, one of the tunes that our studio is learning. You know, I have our studio learn a couple tunes a semester, five or six tunes a semester all together so we can um, you know, have some shared repertoire. So this week's tune was was Web City. It says, how would you transcribe something difficult or out of your comfort zone? 
I mean, I, that's where I live, man. Out of the comfort zone always. If it's not pushing you, you're probably, it's not put, it should, every transcription should push you in some way. Either it's vocabulary, it's technique, maybe it's tempo, maybe it's sound quality, maybe it's clarity, maybe it's double tonguing. Like everything you do should have a purpose, especially when you're studying, like you're in school, like with a teacher, like that can help you guide you. Like you want to go deep into not only things that you really like, but things that are really going to get the most bang for your buck out of them. I always think that you're going to rise up to the level of the transcription. So maybe you don't want to pick something that's like impossible. Like if you're going to say, like, let's transcribe the Coltrane on uh, moment's notice or something like that. Maybe you don't want to start there. That might be ideal not to start there, but um, you might want to consider, you know, that you could play parts of it or play parts of it slow um, or that, you know, you're going to have to change octaves. You're talking about bird stuff. You know, my students sometimes have a, they get hung up on like not, like not changing the octave. Like you got to play the octave there. It's going to actually work on trombone for this bebop language stuff. Cause you're never going to play it if it's uncomfortable, you know, like in the lower octave, it's just, you're not going to do it. So there's no point in really like digging super deep into it in that octave, in my opinion, because you're not going to play it. So you might as well put it up an octave. If it's a tune, I would say you want to keep the integrity of the tune, like don't change octaves randomly. But in terms of a solo, like blowing, like if it's in a weird register, like you got to move, move it so that you can do it. But how would I go about it, transcribing that, is I would learn one phrase at a time and I wouldn't move on until I couldn't play it wrong. I'm never going to make a mistake. You know what I mean? Like you got to practice it until you can't do it wrong. A lot of people just practice until... Um, they've got it and they're like oh yeah I can play that now a day or two goes by and then they can't play it they come up they come for their lesson and they can't do it anymore because they didn't actually practice it long enough so I encourage you to go ahead and really like over practice they say and I read this in some book I forget it's which book this was in that I was reading it's like seven times perfectly you need to do something in order for it to start to get ingrained as a habit so you got to play it at least seven times perfectly and I even go for more than that. So if that's if that's learning a bebop tune, that's playing a transcription, that's learning a lick, taking it through the keys, you know, do one thing until you get it seven times correct. Not all the things like half-assed, you know, you got to really dig in. You know, if it's too fast to play it along with the original recording, play it without the recording, get it up to speed. The one thing, one pet peeve of mine is playing transcriptions at half speed or 75% speed. I like to slow it down if you need to hear something to figure something out but to shed it's a total waste of time because you should either play it on your own out of time slower getting it up to speed or play it in time with the person who you're transcribing why because you're never going to get the flow of the line at a half speed or three quarter speed and some people might want to fight me about this but it's just it's a waste of time to me because you're never going to get the flow and that's really the most important thing about your the transcription the notes is just the notes but the way that they're being played is super important and i always want to focus on the way the notes are being played not necessarily always on the notes themselves because you can always learn more about the notes but the way that they're played that's the how that's what touches people that's what gets the energy going that's what communicates with the band What's your transcription process? Do you learn to sing the whole solo first? Do you write it down, etc.? Okay, so my transcription process, listen to the solo enough that I know how it goes. <laughs> you know, I don't have to think about what comes next because that's the most, that's the part where people get hung up. They jump in too soon and trying to learn it and then they're getting confused about what phrase comes next. So listen to it, sing along as many times as it takes, as many days as it takes to get it internalized to the brain. And then I learn to play it along. And then at the end, after I'm matching exactly JJ or Curtis or whomever, then I'll write it down at the very end so that I can share it with other people. So sing it, play it, write it down, and that way uh, you can share it with other people. And when I write it down, I got this really nitpicky attitude from Steve Teray. I just like to say, I say to my students, imagine that there's the perfect jazz robot out there that could execute this with perfect swing and style that you want to be exact with the way that you write it down. Now, by exact, I don't mean write 64th notes and 32nd notes. I mean, like, write, this is dragged, or this is rushed, or this note is cracked, or this is short, this is long, all of those type of things. And then if that jazz robot could interpolate what you meant by those instructions, that would be perfect. Sometimes we get too nitty, too much in the nitty gritty of like, oh, is that a 32nd note or a triplet? But sometimes it's like, you know what, there's 
six notes in this one beat and I'll just write a six tuplet and say rushed or dragged um, so that you know, okay, there's six beats happening, six notes happening in this one beat or something like that. It's not super important that it's written down exactly like millisecond correct. It's more important that you can communicate the idea of the music to someone else through the, through the transcription sheet music. Uh, he says, what were your musical priorities when you were in college? My musical priorities were to get to New York City. Honestly, that that was my main priority. Like, I'm going to get good enough to get into Juilliard and go to New York City. So that meant a lot of things. That was, um, I wanted to be able to get to New York and I wanted to be able to teach. I wanted to be able to play on all different uh, types of gigs. So that meant I needed to get my sight reading to a level where I could play everything right the first time. Uh, I needed to play the trombone technique up so that I could hopefully someday try to get on the level of the people I aspired to be like. You know, I look at like the next generation older than me, which is people like Ryan Keberly and Michael Deese and James Burton and Marshall Jilks. You know, they're, I think, seven, eight, nine years older than me to maybe 10 at the most, you know, so like the next generation older and look at what they're doing. What, the, what kind of things are they playing? What kind of things can they do? What do I need to be able to do to be able to hang with them? You know, um, obviously, there's also people like Elliot Mason. And then uh, the next generation, even beyond that, the Wycliffe, Vince Gardner, Steve Davis, and then older than that too. But um, so, you know, figuring out what are the practical skills that I need to have and then getting those in terms of working, in terms of playing jazz, you know, developing a point of view. You know, I really, but really I was just focused on getting into Juilliard and getting to New York because I wanted, it was like, it was very clear to me, like from Rochester, I could do, um, I was doing as much as I could do there. And I, it was time to move on. It was very clear to me. Uh, there was a specific gig where I remember looking around and seeing all the musicians and they were all the top call musicians around that area. And I was like, oh, OK, well, it's time to go, <laughs> you know. So uh, I just keep trying to keep trying to move forward. So that was it. Trying to practice as much as I could. Favorite train records. I've had different phases of different ones. Coltrane Sound for a while. You know, Giant Steps, like when I was really studying Giant Steps. I mean, I love Blue Train. Crescent. Crescent is great. I had a, a, a phase with Love Supreme. I kind of really go in, fra in phases. Are there any younger players who you think are paving the way to become the new great voices on the trombone? <laughs> that's a tough question. I feel like I'm still a young trombonist that's trying to make his way and do the same thing, man. You know, there's a guy named Jack Cotts, Joe Gior Giordano. He sounds good. Uh, I, I don't know what age group defines, you know, the next generation. But I think there's people like Drew Kilpella, Kilpella who um, maybe is kind of off the radar. People don't know. DJ, DJ Rice is doing great work. Jack Courtright is on my studio. He's one of the finalists for the JJ competition. There's one of Conrad's students. You know, some of the guys that were at Juilliard with me or just after me, like Jeffrey Miller and uh, Andrew, Andy Clausen, Javier Nero are doing great stuff. I mean, there's a lot of guys doing a lot of great stuff, man. It's really, it's really crazy. Kalia. Ben Devender. There's a lot of great people doing great stuff. Corey Wilcox, this plays great. There's no shortage, I'll tell you that. Saw a video of you at ATW, I think, playing on an Edwards. What made you switch over to the 3B? All right, so I play 3B plus. Uh, so that's a 525 bore. I played on that Edwards from 2009 when I finished at Eastman until 2014 or so. I started playing, looking for something else, looking towards a uh, the 525 bore instead of the 508 bore. It's just the sound, man. The, there's something about that Edwards that it was always locked in. So it was always good sound, but it was always like one sound, you know. Um, it was a little bit inflexible, and I wanted to be able to be a little bit more flexible with the sound. So um, I wanted a medium bore. Brush finished had just been bothering me, and I wanted something else. So that, that was where I started to switch over, and I just like that sound. I mean, I think probably... You know, my teachers have something to do with that. Steve Ture plays on a dual bore setup, and Steve Davis, you know, he plays on a larger setup. I just like that sound. Slide Hampton plays on a, was playing on a big giant setup for a long time. Not that I feel like I need to, you need to play on a big setup to get a big sound, but there's a certain sound concept. And the, the medium bore, the 525, you can either push it kind of hard and kind of focused, and you can end up getting the, kind of more focused sound that you need to play lead or you know more bright funk rock salsa kind of music and then you can also kind of play with a more full sound or more like courtesy Curtis Fullery sound or something like that so but you know I think it's not that important what sound what horn you're playing it's more about the sound of what you're trying to achieve you know 
you want to have that kind of match between the equipment and the sound concept you have. But if you don't have a sound concept, then it's going to be hard to uh, match up that equipment. You know, there are trade offs always. If you go the big sound route, people are going to say, oh, well, you can't play lead and stuff like that. And it's like a little silly. But, um, you know, Robin Eubanks plays lead, he plays on a big trombone. Does it sound a little different? Yeah. But I'm into things sounding like the people that are playing, man. I'm not like I don't want something to sound like a generic version of that thing. Like I want a lead trombonist or I want whatever. It's like eh, I want a person, man. Like that's why I love Duke Ellington's music and his band. Like it sounds different. When <laughs> there's different people in the band, it sounds different. And I think that's what it's supposed to be. Same thing with uh so many bands, you know. Miles's bands. It sounds different when there's different people in the band. I've been thinking about it a lot because of you know, Chick Corea passing and everything. And he talked about just collaborators and projects and projects having a sound based on the um, people that were in that project and the, how they played. And I just listening to it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's definitely true. He sounds similar, but the project dif has a different sound. And he says, what's your daily schedule in general, including practice time? I'm going to tell you my daily practice routine when I was in college, and then I can contrast it with what's happening more recently. Uh, to be just to be realistic and transparent, you know, in college, what I discovered from doing a long work through, I suppose, of a lot of different types of practicing, realizing how much time I was wasting on Twitter or Facebook or whatever back in, you know, 2010 through 2012. Um, one of my teachers at Juilliard, Ron Carter, he talked about keeping a practice journal. And so I decided to do that for a while and figure out um, what was the best. I found, and I find a lot of people, a lot of trombone players do this, is we get caught up so much in the fundamental routine that we don't get to like the next level of fundamentals, meaning like we do our routine, but then we don't get to the technique building kind of section, like actually getting better at specific tasks, specific ideas like multiple tonguing or triads or seventh chords or mo's or that second part where you're working actively on actual material is going to get you better, you know, shapes, sounds, all this kind of thing. So we usually do that and we skip ahead to like the music part and we just like play tunes and turn on the I real B or turn on Abersol and just blow, 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 blow. So uh, what I discovered is I organize things into a couple sections. Sorry, I know I'm getting back to your point here, Dr. B. One is the fundamentals, but fundamentals plus the technique stuff. So what is it? There's like got to be like something that I'm working on that's like technical that I can't do yet. Right. So that goes into like a first slot that could be uh, I discovered 90 minutes was around as long as I can focus for effectively. So I decided uh, 90 minutes would kind of be my goal. Sometimes if I'm super in the zone, like I can go for two hours, but 90 minutes is a pretty lengthy amount of time for me to kind of focus. Uh, the next kind of phase, take a break, do other stuff, go to class, you know, whatever it is that you're doing and then come back to it and then hit like classical repertoire using jazz a to jazz and pro, jazz transcriptions as etudes or or actual jazz etudes or things like that things that you're trying to play pieces you're trying to play not improvising pieces like written pieces for another hour hour and a half another 90 minute session maybe there's more of that technique stuff in there and then a third session which is jazz stuff like improvising learning tunes playing transcriptions as a third 90 minute to two hour section so if you do all three of those you end up with like six hours if you do 90 minutes in each one of those, you're at four and a half hours. So four to six hours was kind of the sweet spot for me. It really varied around school and class and stuff. There was no kind of routine. I'm not a person that likes routine. I hate it. I discovered the longer we go in this pandemic, the more I try to get into a routine, the more I dislike it. So I don't know. I'm just a, not a person who likes routine. I liked a different, different schedule every week. I like that. Um, and that's what it was for years when I was, you know, just touring and doing more, mostly that stuff. Um, so it's just something I need to get over, but uh, not much of a routine person in terms of that. But now the practicing routine is a lot more condensed, um, focusing a lot on the things that are going to get me the most bang for my buck. So things like pitch bends and long tones and learning tunes and stuff that's going to expand my knowledge, filling in holes where like, oh, I never, I never actually learned that or some things like that, you know. Um, trying to keep up with my students. My students pushing me all the time, trying to stay on top of uh, being able to play with their playing and their lessons. You know, sometimes sometimes they mop the floor with me because I'm like, I haven't played that in a long time. So that's, that's really great and a really great thing. 
I don't know. I think for the students to see, it's like, oh, you know, like I have to practice too to keep up with them. You know, I can do certain things that they can't do, but they can do things that I can't do. And that's OK. You know, which rhythm changes solos that you have transcribed do you feel has given you the most vocabulary? I'm not a huge rhythm changes fan. Uh, I've been recording a lot of I'm creating a new course, a rhythm changes course. Um, because it's so such an important thing to learn, and a lot of people, you know, struggle with rhythm changes. There's a lot of great solos, some JJ solos, but I always send people to Lester Leaps In first, Lester Young, Lester Leaps In to learn uh, to get the basics together. And then there's so many tunes that have different good things about them, all the way from JJ playing rhythm changes, all the way through to like Yulio with Elliot Mason playing like all kinds of substitutions and all that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of vocabulary, I actually usually send people to learning more rhythm changes heads because it's more about getting the sound of the changes in your ear um, to me. And so if you learn like 10 rhythm changes heads, like bebop rhythm changes heads, you're going to be just as set up as if you learn like a bunch of solos. I think learning the tune, learning the tunes is, you know, half the battle, learning the um, the overall big picture strategies of improvising over it different ways of thinking of it, playing it on piano, all of those things are more important to me than like, I'm gonna do 15 rhythm changes solos, right? And you could transcribe one Sonny Stitt solo on it and have all the vocabulary you're gonna need. Because did you ever have a phase where you didn't warm up? I had a phase where I needed to figure out how to play without warming up, that's one thing. That I think happens, you basically just decide that you don't have to do it anymore not do it anymore, but you have to basically decide it's like, I'm going to play good no matter what. Um, that doesn't matter if I just got off the plane and I have no warm up. So you have to practice playing cold, you know, teaching is a great way because I'm not playing most of the lesson. And then I pick up the horn and I want it to sound good, right? So it doesn't always happen. But that practice of picking up a cold horn and just playing, while I don't recommend it like all the time, I mean, if I have time to warm up, I'm going to warm up. But that is a skill, I think, in and of itself. And I think being a freelancer, it happens all the time where you're running late, something's happening, get on the stage, go, 100%. There's no warming up. There's no, no time for that. So um, I would say just the real, real life was the time where I kind of learned how to do all of that. And you just go, man. You just got to decide. For most of classical player, what do you think are the most important things to practice for fluency and improvisation within a jazz context? The most important thing is that you need to transcribe and play along with the records because most of the problems we have transitioning over are one, conceptual, and two, articulation. And the only way you're going to get that articulation is by trying to match exactly players that have that articulation, that quote-unquote jazz articulation, which is to me, somewhere in between, I'm stealing this from Steve Trey again, I'm, it's somewhere in between, excuse me, um, stega, staccato and legato. He calls it staccato. Um, so right in the middle, it's got a clean front, a nice body, and a little separation, right? Because you would have connected and separated, but right in the middle. And then that flow of the eighth notes, and that comes from matching exactly, 100% trying to sound exactly like the people you're transcribing. So transcribe a couple JJ, a couple Curtis, a couple Slide, whoever you like. You know, I wouldn't go to some people that are like super, super stylized, like someone like Ray Anderson or something crazy, or Wycliffe even, like I love Wycliffe. His particular vocabulary isn't gonna help you as much, like get the most bang for your buck in terms of learning the style as like JJ or Curtis. And then you can go and transcribe Wycliffe to get all those decorations and the vibe and the blues and everything. Because obviously, like me, he was how I discovered playing trom jazz trombone for the most part. But like in terms of like the most bang for your buck, you know. So transcribe. That's how. Match the articulation. Match the flow of the eighth notes. I also love the idea of learning rhythm heads for vocabulary and taking them through the keys. Are there five to ten melodies you recommend? I mean, obviously, there's the classics. Lester Leaps In, Confirmation. I kind of group them from like riff-based and then go through um, like bebop and then like ones that are variations on rhythm changes. So obviously there's I Got Rhythm, you gotta know that one. Cottontail, those are some like early ones, there's three. And then you got your bebop ones like, you know, Web City is one, that's a, that's a variation one. So Anthropology obviously is like the big one that everybody wants to know, wants you to know. Serpent's Tooth, I mentioned that tune, is another one that's a variation on rhythm changes. Uh, you could learn like Thad Jones tunes, like Fingers, Olio, Turnpike, excuse me, that's the JJ one. There you go. There's a bunch. 
Touch, Eternal Triangle. I, w w I would do all the ones that people call Rhythmining. And these are all in B flat. <laughs> then you got to find some that are in other keys. For learning the form of a tune, what would you recommend is the most effective way to learn all the voice leading in a limited time? I think I'm going to go add bass walking into my regiment more. I think that's a great idea. Um, you, the best way to learn voice leading is to play the piano um, and play the thirds and the sevenths, and that forces you to um, play it, one, look at it, two, and hear it, three. So um, if I, I just learn a tune on the piano, I don't even need to learn a tune on the trombone if I can learn it on the piano, right? It's all mental at a certain level. You're just trying to remember the voice, and to practice voice leading, I teach a concept with my students Specifically for voice leading, we have thirds to sevenths, thirds to seventh, thirds to sevenths. That's cool. But then more of like a counterpoint approach where we take species counterpoint, like the classical species counterpoint, and apply it to chord changes. So what does that mean? Well, we do note against note. So that's like if it's one chord per bar type of tune, that's whole notes in each bar. And you're improvising against the bass note, right? So if the bass is moving in one direction, maybe you want to move in the other direction. And it's not like leaping around to connect the thirds to the sevenths. And it's trying not to repeat the notes. And it's trying to get to more tones because there's more voice leading that happens in a tune than just the third to the seventh. So we do note against note. And then we do two notes against one note, so like half notes. And then we do four, which ends up sounding like a bass line, um, but focused on the counterpoint rather than only the bass line. Because sometimes people will go, bo do de do 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 de do bo do de de bo do de do 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 de de do do spitting out mode of like just whatever arpeggios they know. So I force the students to do half notes, quarter notes, and then if we can get to like an eighth note flow stage where you're improvising constant eighth notes against the bass note. And then uh, you can explore different colors and all that, but definitely getting to the quarter note phase is a good one and getting out of the arpeggio land and into actually playing quarter notes that are counterpoint or lines um, is a good way to take the bass, well, the bass line walking to the next level. Eli says you've been listening to Lawrence Brown, Killen. What do you get out of his playing? A, lot of, a bunch of things. Lawrence Brown obviously is another one that predates Benny Green, right, by a little bit. He's one of those transitional figures from the swing area moving towards uh, bebop, you know, and j while I'm thinking about it, JJ also used to talk about Frank Rehack um, as one of the earlier trombonists. There's not that, there's not as many recordings of Frank um, as there is of JJ, for example, but. So Lawrence Brown, love Lawrence Brown, a huge Ellington person, something just, you know, about him is like, he had to fill a lot of roles, you know? He played a lot of different stuff. He played really technical stuff, like check out Blue Cellophane if you don't know that. He really, like he was the first one to play that. And it's like, man, he was really had technical mastery of the trombone. And then w and when Tricky Sam died, he had to take over with all that plunger stuff that nobody knew how to do, uh, the Pixie Mute and plunger stuff. And like he got killing at that. And then he plays like certain roles and different Ellington pieces, like embodying different people uh, or different personas, you know. Uh, he was able to do so many different things. So I take that from him. And he never necessarily had to play bebop. He played the way he played, you know. There's a great record of his. Um, there's a tune on there called Down the Street, Round the Corner Blues uh, that I spent a long time with when I was at Juilliard, really digging into Lawrence. And there's just a certain vocal quality that comes from studying with, f studying his playing. Um, a buddy of mine, Joe McDonough, he would he was deep doing some other tracks from that record, like Rose of the Rio Grande. Anyway, we both were di diving into it kind of at the same time with Steve Turay. Yeah, man, there's just like so much more. When there's less decoration and less like bebop-isms, there's more like soulful content to it, I guess, more simple stuff to take out of it. We get kind of, you know, you can just, you can kind of take more out of it, more simple things away when you kind of take some of that stuff away. So those are the two things I take away from Lawrence is he was the master of doing a whole bunch of different stuff and he was able to do all of that without um, sacrificing his artistry. You know, he could play a role and he could play whatever he wanted. Like, it was pretty incredible. And just he was a master of the trombone and a great artist. What's your favorite blues head to call on a jam session? I've been calling SKJ for the last couple of years because nobody wants to play a, key, a blues in something other than F. So I like uh, D flat. I like D flat blues. So I call, I call SKJ. And nobody plays the right changes in bars 9 and 10, but that's okay. Usually I let other people call the tunes. I'm not, I don't, you know, I don't care that much. Uh, I want to play whatever everyone else wants to play. 
But if I had to pick, I would pick SKJ because it's in D flat. And if I was going to pick something else, I like to I like to call Freight Train, but that's a bird blues, and I like to play blues for Alice because that's a bird blues, and I just like playing bird blues. Or I like bird like. I like take the coal train. Do you incorporate singing in your practice? I was a, kind of a singer first when I was young, like in middle school and in high school. So I kind of was always singing when I was learning to play trombone, when first learning. So it was I always felt like it was really great back and forth because it developed your sense of pitch in a much different way. Because when you're singing, you know, you don't have to, you know, go to the piano, but you can just sing, you know, in tune with the other people. But in terms of singing, I try to sing stuff because it helps your ear. I don't have a good like high range, so there's a lot of stuff I can't I can't sing. <laughs> Wycliffe always is trying to get me to sing, get, develop that falsetto, but I, I don't have it. I'm not going to do it for you now. But yeah, in lessons, I try to sing stuff. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, so I try to force myself to get better at it. Um, there was a lot of training that we had at Juilliard in the oral skills class, you know, to sing. We, had, we used to have to sing. A, a tenor clef line play an alto clef line and a bass clef line and like it was also like clef clef reading but it was like you know sight singing and doing that that was hard <laughs> but and then at eastman there we used to have to sing all different kinds of weird shapes like atonal shapes um, which is all really good for your ear i think you know singing helps you internalize stuff so i'm all for it really so thanks for being here we'll be back next friday have a wonderful weekend and uh, I'll catch you all soon. Thanks again for being here. See you next week.